Thank you. Uh, it is my turn to welcome all of you here. Uh, we're very excited to see you here, and I hope you are going to have a wonderful two days uh, in, uh, during this conference. Um, I will be uh, uh, making my introduction wearing to this, uh, to this conference really wearing two hats. My first and foremost hat, as uh, uh, Dr. Wilkin said, is that of an AI researcher. So I have been working in AI for the last 20 years. Um, I started in robotics. I remember the time when robots didn't move, didn't do anything, and now we are talking about autonomous cars. Uh, my group has been developing AI techniques for making robots move. We've worked with cars, we've worked with robots in, um, uh, in industry, we've worked with uh, robots that move in the sea, in the air, and in space. And also 20 years ago, I started working in structural computational biology where the machines there are proteins and they do amazing uh, 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 jobs inside our body and our uh, quest was to understand how by changing the shape they can perform their function. And AI methods allow us to look at this problem at a detail that, and a scale that was not possible before. My second hat during this introduction is that of the director of the Ken Kennedy Institute. Um, this is our inaugural conference, as Dr. Wilkins said, and we really believe that this is the right place and the right time for a conference in AI and health to bring together the community for research and applications in this broader area of AI and health. So starting this introduction, I want to take you back actually to 1956. This is the year when the Dartmouth Summer Research Project happened, and by many it's considered the birthplace of AI. So funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, McCarthy, Minsky, Rochester, and Shannon got together at Dartmouth, and this is what they wrote. An attempt would be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now result for humans, and improve themselves. We think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. Well, that, what do you think about this, all right? Fast forward 60 years, we started paying attention. This is when AlphaGo by DeepMind bet with uh, uh, Lee Sedol, he was the professional, uh, one of the top professional Go players in a five game uh, match. Um, really, uh, they, it has been a very bumpy time for AI. There were periods of boom and what we call AI winters. So when AI started, there was a lot of hype, um, over promises, uh, high expectations from users, and a lot of money was put into this area, mainly from DARPA. And then things were not delivered. Uh, DARPA got increasingly frustrated with the uh, speech recognition uh, problem uh, um, at uh, CMU. Um, the Light Hill report uh, um, occurred in the UK, and suddenly funding stopped, and we had the first AI winter around 1975. Uh, um, then expert systems came to be, and uh, there was a whole industry to support them. Lisp machines uh, uh, inv were invented only to be um, actually um, put to, um, to, uh, to uh, they, they didn't do very well because Sun Microsystems came out and gave us a general processor that could do as well. So um, the collapse of the machine market, the end of Japan's fifth generation pro uh, project created a second winter for AI. And then nothing happened for about 10 years. And it was around 2010, I would say, when these things started moving at an increasingly fast speed, okay? And things had changed. I mean, and things had changed drastically. We had new algorithms to work with. We had computation at a scale that we didn't, had not experienced before. And we had data. Lots of data, okay? Digitization of everything. Think about it. Your smartphone, you have your pictures online, speech, text uh, with the World Wide Web. An enormous amount of data that could be processed and a data that was generated in all sorts of different domains. So things changed and really, uh, uh, I think an event that many of us remember was around, uh, around 2012, was in 2012 when a deep net, AlexNet, 
uh, won the ImageNet classification ca challenge. ImageNet is a data set uh, made more of more than 15 million images, and uh, these are labeled with 22,000 classes. And uh, uh, the, the challenge was to do the classification of uh, 1,000 objects. So AlexNet managed to do that with a classification error of two, uh, 0 0.16, which was unheard of at the time. And after that, we have the beginning of the deep learning revolution. Things uh, are um, uh, moving fast, very, very fast, and new issues are beginning to arise in the community. I'm talking about issues of reproducibility. Uh, I'm talking about issues of bias. Algorithms are trained on a set of data, and if you're not included in this data, these algorithms don't work for you. And interpretability, cause and effect. We are going to have a session tomorrow morning that will talk about interpretability uh, organized by Ben Hugh. Uh, and AI is becoming uh, very big at this point. Uh, many believe it's the new calculus. Um, and we uh, need to address a number of issues. Some of them relate to privacy, fairness, and ethics with the use of AI, which is extremely important in the context of, uh, of medicine, and we are going to have a talk uh, this afternoon on exactly this topic. We have to think about the impact on the environment. Um, uh, you may have heard this analogy that to train a deep net for language, you need uh, the carbon emissions of, let's say, about five cars in their lifetime. That's a lot. And the, the impact of jobs, that again, is a big issue and needs to be addressed. Let me now move to AI in health. There is a lot of opportunity here. And uh, uh, the opportunity, um, uh, this, I like this classification from a Nature Medicine uh, article. There's opportunity for diagnostics, therapeutics, administration and regulation of health, and population health management. So when we talk about diagnostics, uh, cancer detection, infectious disease detection, uh, detection using electronic health record, omics data, and image data for screening of diseases. Of therapeutics, an enormous uh, opportunity for data-driven precision medicine, pharmacogenomics, uh, clinical gu di uh, guidelines for common diseases. Administration and regulation, do not underestimate this part. Big data in hospital management, logistics, quality outcome assessments, and disease monitoring. And population health management, extremely important, early disease detection, and uh, guidelines for a healthy lifestyle. So there's a number of opportunity in this area, and things have been happening. Clearly, most attention has been paid to imaging and the application of AI techniques in imaging. And this uh, afternoon, uh, there are a whole session, there's a whole session um, that is organized on uh, AI in imaging. Uh, there is, uh, you open a journal, a medical journal, and you are bombarded by the applications of AI in medicine. I didn't search a lot to find the, the, the articles that I have in this slide. So pancreatic uh, cancer detection on CT scans, um, multi, uh, retinal uh, imaging and optic nerve imaging. This is amazing what is happening in that area. Uh, Real-time imaging for um, uh, detection of adenomas in colonoscopy and a lot done with mammography. It is really uh, exploding. Uh, this is not uh, without uh, issues. For example, the, issues of, the issue of interpretability is, is very big. Um, uh, and uh, many techniques are being used, but it's unclear how successful uh, these are, and clearly there needs to be more research done. For example, salience methods that I'm showing here produce heat maps that highlight the areas of a medical infa image that influence a, a prediction. And this is from a very recent paper. Look at what is happening at the top. This is what the algorithm says is, is responsible for the disease. Look at what is happening at the bottom. This is what the radiology says is important for the disease. So there is a discrepancy. R robustness is becoming a huge issue. Uh, algorithms may work very, very well if you use pristine data that are uh, gathered in one hospital using one machine. But what about if you have 50 different uh, hospitals that use uh, different machines? Can the same algorithm work? This is what uh, is sometimes called the acquisition shift. If you change the scanner, the resolution, the contrast, the modality, the control, does it still work? So a number of issues are open, and there is hugely, um, it's a hugely interesting area.
But what everybody says, and I think here there is kind of a common agreement, is that when you put AIs and humans together, things work well. Um, the, this uh, uh, recent review that appeared on Lancet uh, did a, a, a very comprehensive study going back uh, uh, 15 years and looked at uh, um, a radiologists and x-rays. Their, uh, uh, their uh, um, conclusion was that um, if you put the AI and the radiologist, this is definitely better than the AI alone. And also what is very interesting that the AI and the radiologist is better than the radio radiologist alone. And they have data to support this. Not only that, but sometimes the protocols that involve both the AI and the human can yield increases in sensitivity for a number of clinically relevant subgroups things that are difficult to catch for the radiologist. So it is very promising and clearly something that we should be looking into. But it's not only imaging, okay? It, it is everywhere at this point, AI in health. Genomic analysis. Lots has been happening and we are going to listen from our uh, invited speaker um, who is coming after me, Dr. Richard Gibbs. But deep learning, for example, is used to map uh, cancer-specific somatic mutation rates that are kilo basis, uh, at a kilo base resolution across the genome. We didn't used to do that before. Structure prediction. Well, alpha fold. Suddenly we have 200 million proteins of one million species. Are they all good? Probably not. I mean, almost surely not. But they can provide very interesting hypotheses for us to look at. And just a week ago, Meta came up with what they call the ESM metagenomic atlas. This is 600 million predicted proteins from the metagenome. Okay, metagenome it uses gene sequences to discover uh, proteins in samples that come from the environment, uh, from the soil, from the deep ocean, and so on. What are these proteins doing and do they hold the key for, for uh, treatment of diseases? Nobody knows. But there is a lot happening uh, in uh, drug discovery. Um, this article from Cell uh, was really, is really referenced a lot. It's a deep learning approach to antibiotic discovery, a problem which is uh, very, very uh, difficult to solve and is attracting today a lot of attention. I know from my previous, uh, from my own experience, that the way, for example, that we, um, um, we uh, measured if a small uh, ligand like the one that you see here in, in yellow um, uh, on the right, on the left, um, docks to a protein, the way we, uh, we decide that now with machine learning is very different than the way we decided that a few years ago. The way we decide how to, to deal with flexibility of molecules is very different than the way we decided, uh, the, the way we worked with it several years ago. So treatment response is another area that I find fascinating. So gene expression based inference of cancer drug sensitivity. Amazing. I mean, you go from the gene expression to the cancer sensitivity. Or predicting clinical drug response from cell, uh, cell line compound screening. Things are changing and they are changing a lot and very, very rapidly. I told you that I work in robotics, and I know that in robotics, we were successful when we combined different mod modalities. A self-driving car does not only take images of the environment, it, takes, it also uses a LiDAR, it uses sound and so on to understand what is happening in the environment. And this is what I see happening right now with multimodal uh, data um, uh, being used in, 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 uh, um, uh, in medicine. Uh, look at this, uh, histology, genomic analysis. For, pan, for, for cancer, or x-rays and electronic health records, and so on and so forth. Um, it is something that definitely needs to happen in order to get to more difficult problems. For example, to uh, create a, a system that uh, will uh, predict sepsis, sepsis uh, uh, in hospitals, uh, a topic that, uh, for which there uh, has been tons and tons of papers. Uh, artificial intelligence in mental health is taking advantage of longitudinal data that now can be gathered with uh, different kinds of devices. And tomorrow afternoon, we have a whole topic, on, a whole session on this topic. I borrowed this uh, picture from an article called Multimodal Biomedical AI to show you what, how rich this area is. As far as data modalities are concerned, we have omics data, metabolomics data, microbiome, um, EHRs, electronic health records, scans, wearable biosensors, ambient sensors, and 
things that we know about the environment. I mean, look at that. Look at the, the kind of data that we now have and we have in increasing quantities. There are huge opportunities. Precision health, absolutely. This is what uh, many are working on. But also now people are talking about doing clinical trials in different ways, enhancing them with information from AI. Hospital at home, pandemic surveillance, something that is of interest to all of us. The idea of digital twins, creating a twin, a digital twin of a person that uh, could progress with disease and we could understand how uh, the, uh, the person would respond uh, to disease or how, uh, what needs to be done in order to prevent disease. And of course, uh, virtual health uh, coaches. Um, it is extremely rich, this intersection of AI and health is extremely rich and offers problems for everyone. Uh, and uh, also offers very technical problems for people who are working, who are developing systems. The current paradigm of training at different institutions by shipping the data at different institutions is clearly not going to work for many reasons. One of them is privacy, but another is just scaling. And the proposed paradigm today, shown on the right, is to, to train models at different, uh, uh, at different sites and then ship these models to a trusted aggregation server and shipping a new model back. Well, this is something that is non, highly non-trivial to do and requires systems work and algorithmic work and putting everything together at scale. Um, and even if everything works fine and we have the perfect AI system uh, to work with, vertical integration is a huge issue. So you need to consider the uh, data life cycles. You need to consider the environment. You need to understand how the AI system is embedded in this environment and put all of this together to deploy the AI model and to have it learn as, it, uh, as time goes on, which is totally contrary to the way, let's say, FDA is approving AI algorithms for, um, uh, for use in hospitals. So to uh, conclude, AI-powered health. It can be human-centered healthcare that is predictive, more accurate, more accessible, more equitable, more connected, less expensive, and with better experiences for the patient and the staff. And this is something that I believe we should be striving for. And uh, um, it is uh, definitely uh, AI has a role, to, uh, a very, very significant role to play. But remember, AI is a very, very new field. Health is a century, it's a, it's a field with century old experience. Um, uh, this, uh, we are in Houston. We are, we have six educational institutions uh, here. We have several hospitals with research teams. This is the perfect place for cross-functional teams that can attack the kind of problems that, uh, uh, that uh, exist in this intersection of AI and health. And my uh, own um, uh, opinion is that we need to approach this extremely uh, difficult uh, topic, not with the hype that we have seen in AI, but with humility. Okay, with humility, understanding where technologies can help and where they need to back off, understanding where technology can actually enhance, uh, the, enhance health. So this is why this conference, and uh, we are, uh, the Ken Kennedy Institute is very happy to, um, uh, to help uh, launch uh, efforts uh, on this topic. Uh, as uh, you saw, uh, uh, as you heard, uh, Dr. Wilkins, she is willing to, and we are willing to talk with all of you who would, be, who would like to get involved in this effort and make it uh, much larger than uh, our conference uh, uh, today. I would like to uh, um, finish by thanking our sponsors who made this uh, conference possible and also thank all of you for being here. And I really hope that you're going to enjoy this conference. Okay, thank you.